Hello, care partners. So great to see you here. Teresa Youngstrom, Memory Care with Teresa Youngstrom. I appreciate you coming back. Hey, we have another great guest speaker for you today and uh, from another part of the country. You know, I love bringing in people with different perspectives, different specialties, and Leslie Fuller is like that. So I'd like to tell you about my friend, Leslie Fuller. Leslie um, is the owner of Inspired Senior Care, a Las Vegas-based company specializing in dementia care training and consulting. With an impressive background, Leslie spent 12 years in leadership roles within the realms of independent living, dementia care, and as a divisional dementia care manager, laying the foundation for her expertise. A licensed master of social work, so that's different for us, and a certified dementia practitioner, Leslie is not only dedicated to her business, but also actively contributes to her community. She serves as a community educator for the Alzheimer's Association and has held the title of Positive Approach to Care Independent Trainer. Currently, she resides in the vibrant city of Las Vegas, Nevada. Leslie brings a wealth of knowledge and passion to the field of senior and dementia care management. Welcome, welcome, Leslie. Hello. Good morning, my friend. Good to see you. It's so great to see you, too. Um, how's Las Vegas? Um, Las Vegas is good, about 800 miles that way. I'm in Kansas City right now, as a matter of fact. Okay. All right. Well, we just love getting um, different professionals from different parts of the world to give their perspectives because they may do it differently where you are. And I'm excited about that. We're um, old friends and colleagues. And so welcome, welcome. I know I've got a ton of questions and I want to get started with the questions. So maybe just first, tell me about your business. What, do, what is your, your business is different than my business. And it so is. tell me a little bit about your business. So my business takes the same concepts that I think you work with, Teresa. You tend to work with families. Um, my goal is to work with senior living communities, home care agencies, hospice agencies, to help um, bring the same type of knowledge to their staff and to the leaders of their companies to be able to give that message to their staff. Uh, a lot of times the, uh, the leadership know that they want the culture to be a certain way in their community to support their residents. But as far as how to teach their staff, they're lacking tools. And uh, my company created a set of tools to use, including posters to hang up. It's a monthly topic. Um, so just cover, um, I'll go back to posters, conversation cards, lesson plans um, on covering 12 different topics. So I focus on a topic a month so everybody can kind of have their mind on the same area. And then the next month change to a different topic. So that's, that's my goal is to help those leaders to support their staff in learning these messages. Exciting. So having worked in a memory care and assisted living unit, mm -hmm. I can just see how that would be so great because, you know, we can huddle up and <laughs> encourage people and maybe have an idea, but what if we practiced a new technique for a month, you know, and we had the posters around and the, and the you know, the cards to remind people, this is what we're learning this month mm -hmm. and more of an experiential training. I love that. So yeah. what are some of the early changes you experienced with people, you know, say with communication, with people living with a dementia? So in the earlier stages, when we may not even know that they are living with dementia, they're starting, they, they probably know something is not the same. Mm. Uh, but a lot of people tend to, you know, put up that facade, I'm fine, I'm fine. But there are changes that are going on in the brain and there's some slowing of processes in the brain. So one of the first things is um, being slower to understand maybe the words that you're saying. So if you think about it, if, if the part of the brain, uh, your left temporal lobe, which processes wording, if it's struggling a bit, it's going to slow down in taking in that information that's being given to them. The words that I'm saying right now, um, it would take you longer to really grasp what I'm saying. Doesn't mean you can't, it's just a little bit slower process. And so if I say something and then ask you a question, it's gonna take you a little bit longer to process what I said to you, and then to think about how I wanna respond, then gather those words, 
and then relay those words. There's so many steps involved in that communication that we don't even think about because you and I can just, boy, we can just pop conversation off, right? Take all that and slow it down a little bit. So that's where you might see changes where it's like, mom seems confused. Well, mom's not necessarily confused as she has to have that time to process and to slow down. And so what can happen is with those changes, if I'm continuing to keep my conversation going like I always have, she might tend to shut down a little bit because it's frustrating to her because I I kind of am perceived that I'm not paying attention to her. I'm not giving her time. And then so she's just like, fine, whatever. And then she'll shut down. So you might start seeing your relationship changing a little bit, but it's really not changing. It's just her trying to grapple with how those changes are affecting. Um, difficulty finding words. I think we've all been through that. Even I'm 58 and I'm seeing a slight change in that, which is normal aging, but that becomes more and more challenging is finding that right word. Um, I was with a woman yesterday. I'm a hospice social worker now. And um, with her condition, she is her brain is foggy, she says. And she was very much able to tell me, um, I need your help in prompting me. I need your help in getting me back on target. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a beautiful thing that she was able to say that, um, which is a great part of being aware and being open with a dialogue that there is a change going on versus somebody who the family is like, oh, we don't talk about this. Let's hide it. Um, we're not going to bring it up. We don't want to insult her. So when you do that, she loses that ability to let you know what can help her. So it's very important if somebody is struggling with these things to be able to say, hey, I, I get it. If you'd like my help in, in prompting you, that's fine. Oh, does that, do you just want me to give you time to find it? I can do that too. Let them take the lead and give, you take the sting out of them struggling with that. It's like, I'm, I'm here. I'm not in any rush. We'll just carry on this conversation. So I'm, I'm kind of getting on to how to help them. But um, these, these are some of the struggles that they're dealing with and realizing they're having this go on all day long in every conversation, in every interaction they're having, they are working so hard. You're just talking, you're just being normal. They're working really hard. So having respect for them in where they are in that and being a support for them instead of questioning or judging them. Uh, so along with this whole thing of sometimes you will see them not only back away from you, but because they're experiencing this all the time, they start backing away from social engagements, from going out. No, that's OK. I don't want to do that because it's just too much work. Um, they might feel embarrassment if they haven't if they aren't surrounded by people who are supportive of them. Uh, so they start backing away from things. Uh, and they just give up because sometimes they can't they can't express themselves the way they want to. It's like, fine, just just never mind. And they throw their hands up. So take a moment experientially to walk yourself what it would feel like. Imagine yourself being in a crowd of people who don't speak your language and you don't speak theirs. Or maybe you just know a few words. And at what point do you go, I, I just, this is too hard. I, I just can't do it. And then they start socially backing away. And we all know that social interactions are so important to healthy living, no matter what age you are. So um, the more we can help them to feel heard and to feel a part of things um, and to still be asked to contribute to a conversation is, is really important. Um, and sometimes also it can just, they can feel too overwhelmed. There's too much input. Sometimes I think uh, I've seen where um, an individual, the family wants to come support them. So we bring all the family in and you've got the grandkids yelling and screaming and running around and they just, they retreat and go back in the bedroom because, well, what's wrong with grandma? Where'd grandma go? We came over here to see her. She is overwhelmed. <laughs> 
So I think those are some of the things early on that we need to gauge, um, you know, kind of take observations and see then what we can do to help alleviate some of those situations. Yeah, I think it's interesting that by the time we recognize there's a problem or they're making mistakes they can't cover for, which we're like, "Uh uh-oh, there's a problem here. They've been struggling with this for a while. And that's so sad. And you're, you made a great point. Um, I think sometimes the family doesn't realize, well, they might plan an event, a holiday event in Mm -hmm. the evening when everybody can come. And by then she shot, Mm -hmm. we made sure and had someone with my mom. So if the wheels started to fall off, you Mm -hmm. know, we could, back out before, you know, there was an, a, a, you know, a verbal event that would not be, you know, would be remembered forever, but not, not in an advantageous way. So, yeah. um, and I remember sitting with her and having her say, I need to go home. And we were at her house <laughs> and uh-huh. I, said, I need to go home too. Let's go get our coat, <laughs> you know? And I would take her in her own bedroom mm-hmm. and, um, and she could rest. I could get her something to drink or eat, and we would get away from the stem. So you're so right about that. So you've told a lot about what's going on from the patient's perspective, but I would guess that there are a lot of skills, communication skills that the caregiver or the family member, but the, mm-hmm. that the care partner needs to learn. What, what would be some of your suggestions? Sure. Uh, I think one of them is, the biggest thing is, because you notice a change in their communication and there's a change going on in their brain, don't just assume that, oh my gosh, they can't do anything. They can't think. And don't start taking over for them. Um, That's key. Just because they've lost some abilities or those abilities are being challenged, they just need our guidance and support. I love what you said there, Teresa, about having that So imagine, imagine superstars, right? Superstars, when they go places, they have a team with them. They have an assistant. They have maybe a bodyguard. It doesn't mean that person can't do everything. They're just there to support them. And that's what we need to do. We need to be able to be there to sense when things, like you said, the wheels are falling off and we can, we can be there for them to kind of help out where they need help. They don't need help in everything. So don't try to take over and don't make assumptions on what they can't do. Uh, In social work, we look at the strengths-based perspective, which means we focus, it's, it's very different than the medical model, right? A medical model, okay, what's wrong and how can we try to fix that or deal with it? In a strengths-based perspective, we first look at what's going right what is she, you know, mom may be struggling with the communications, but guess what? She can still make those cookies for the family gathering, right? So why not have, why not make that a bigger focus of the event than conversation of the event? So finding ways, what are their strengths? What's going well for them and help support that. Be their guide, be their support. I like to use analogy sometimes of If you had a person who, let's say tomorrow, I lost my right hand, people wouldn't look at me and go, oh my gosh, Leslie lost her hand. She can't do anything and start doing everything for me. They wouldn't do that. They would say, wow, Leslie lost her right hand. How can we maybe adjust the kitchen for her that she only has one hand? What things can we do to support her so that it makes it easier for her with that right hand being gone? Same concept applies if we think when somebody is living with dementia, we need to look at it that way. Okay, there's some things that aren't going right there, but how can I support them and help them with just that area, not everything? Um, Always keep in mind, they're not children. They are not useless. (laughs) They are not crazy. They are just Um, having some gaps in their thinking, and we're there to help get them back on track of where they can do well and to do like Teresa says, realize when we need to say, it's time to back off. Let's let's maybe give them some rest during that time. Um, When we notice that somebody is getting lost in conversation, we we can support them by doing something very simple. We just need to slow down our speech, slow down our 
thought processes slow down our our need to multitask, right? Because I think we tend to do that. So, or avoid answering for them too quickly. Um, I was with my father-in-law last year at a restaurant and he, he had, he had early stage dementia and the waiter and a very young waiter who's probably had none of this training. Uh, this is where I love to go in and train restaurant staff on how to handle these situations. Um, and the waiter came up, asked me what I wanted. I told him and he asked my father-in-law what he wanted and he kind of looked at him. And then he looked down at the menu and I think the waiter maybe gave him five seconds, maybe five seconds. And then he looked at me and said, what does he want? And I looked at the waiter and then I looked at dad and I said, well, I said, he's looking at the menu. If you can just give him a little bit of time, he'll make his own choice. And it probably took my father-in-law 20 to 30 seconds. And then he was able to decide what he wanted and then turned to the gentleman. And this poor young guy was just, you could tell it was killing him because he's in a mindset. He's like this all the time. And he kept looking at me like he wanted me to take the order or to provide the order. And dad just needed time. He just needed patience. He needed us to be on his time and not this young waiter's time. Um, I had, uh, let's see. Hold on, I have one more one more story I was going to tell on that, and my my brain just slipped a gear. Um, I already told you that story. That's okay. Um, so next, tackle one task at a time. So what can happen is they they may very easily be able to follow a suggestion you gave them or a request you gave them, but if you throw another one on and then another one on all of a sudden they, they've lost all of them. So tackle one task at a time if you possibly can. Uh, my mother-in-law is experiencing some dementia now, and but yet she's still, when it comes to the bank and comes to money, she is a number, she can do all the numbers. But when it comes to the processing and the sequencing of things that need to happen, that's where she's struggling, struggling a bit. And it's very frustrating for her because she's always been so good at that. So uh, we had to, we had an account that we were liquidating. So we had to go to the bank. We had to get a signature, but then we had to go get one more thing. And then we had to go back to the bank. There were multiple steps. Mm -hmm. And so for her, she's just like, well, it's just never going to happen. And so what I did was I wrote down the different steps that it was going to take for us to do that. And I said, we're going to focus on just the first step, mom, mm-hmm. we need to go to the bank and get such and such signed. And she was like, okay. And I said, and then when I come back later this week and we check that one off, we're going to go to those others, but we're not going to worry about that today. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that helped her so much because this big project was full of so many details and she just couldn't handle. It was just too much to tackle. But one thing at a time, she did just fine with. Um, if you're going to go run errands with someone, don't tell them, well, we're going to go to the grocery store and then we're going to go over to Kohl's and then we'll go out to lunch. I, we're going to go to this favorite place you want. It's like, no, no, I don't want to go. It's just too much. Mm-hmm. Like one thing at a time, maybe two. <clears throat> How about we go to the grocery store and then we'll go to Kohl's. Does that mm-hmm. sound okay? So yeah. giving them chunks at a time that they can handle. Yeah. Cause we make the mess of that. We come in with our agenda. Mm, it's like, uh-huh. oh boy, yeah, we need to get a shower. We need to do the toenails. We need to do, we need to do. And they can just shut down. And it's so hard. Um, it's so great that you asked that um, waiter to be patient, you know, yeah. in so many, not so many yeah. words. Um, a while back, it occurred to me that on the back of my business card, I should put, please be patient. My friend has dementia. And I've learned that whether it's uh, a cashier, at the grocery store or, you know, someone, waiter, waitress, they, then they, I tell you what, they get on board, you know, or I had one woman who would say, honey, that shirt's a little too tight. You know, the front of temporal (laughs) filter's gone. And, um, but, but I, and so I slid a business card over to her and, you know, she was like, Uh Yeah, she said it's a little too tight. I'll I'll work on that. You know, she just gave it to her, you know, let her let her have that statement, let her feel like she was right. And so but I love these suggestions. I want to hear your suggestions on, you know, it's a chronic debilitating progressive disease. Uh And as they get worse, 
we need new suggestions on, well, we need to know what they're going to look like. And we all, we know if you've met one person with dementia, you've met one person. So they're all going to be a little bit different, but what we're going to see, what we might see in your loved one. And then what do we do differently as they change and as they get worse? Sure. You know, as the disease progresses, everything that we've talked about so far is magnified. It's just even more so. Um, the ability to understand words is lessening. The ability to use words effectively is lessening. Um, frustration because of their inability to share their thoughts, um, they begin starting to shut down. <clears throat> so again, I think if we go back to what we've said, let's ramp up all the skills that we've learned so far, including, I think it's going back to that, that analogy of if you are with somebody who speaks a different language, how do we communicate? Mm -hmm. We have so many ways in our world that we communicate without words, mm -hmm. but we're not aware of it because we're all full of the words. You know, we're, we, we do this all the time, but what if you couldn't do that? Could you still have a relationship with someone? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it is important for us to learn how to communicate with them through the other senses that we have. Through, so through touch. So let's just say relaying, you can't say, if you say, I love you, mom, and those words just don't seem to be clicking, how else can we tell mom I love you? We can tell her we love her by holding her hand, mm -hmm. by giving her a hug, by making eye contact, by smiling, by looking at pictures together and looking at them. No words are needed for any of that. If they still are able to follow some words, use fewer words, use very specific words. So mom, sit here. And we can also use visual cues, using your hands because they, they can still see unless they have vision issues, right? But using your hands, having her follow your hand, mom, sit here and have her look down at the seat, you've given her a visual cue and you've given very few words. It's very clear. There's less room for her to get confused or misinterpretation if we lessen that. Um, you'll notice also that I think, as you said, like with the, oh, that shirt's too tight or that, you know, that I've heard all sorts of things. Um, there is, uh, because of the change to the frontal lobe, they have a lack of empathy for you. And that's okay. Remember what all they're going through. They're struggling just to get the words out. So having that filter that keeps them from saying things that maybe to you feel hurtful, feel critical, feel racist or sexist. Mm -hmm. We see those a lot. It's very important for you to recognize that that is not their intent that is not their um, intention in hurting you. This is the disease causing changes in their brain that are confusing what they think and what they mean to relay to you. So we need to have patience with that. And, you know, a big thing is being able to say, wow, you think this shirt is a little tight? Well, maybe, I, you know what? I've been wanting to go buy some, buy some new shirts. Thanks for that suggestion, right? So we recognize the fact she's having thoughts. Why take offense at it? Why not turn it around so she feels good about what she says, right? Because she can't help it. Yeah. Would you say, in my experience, it seems like the person with memory failure, with brain change, they seem to be hardest on the person closest to them, yet they'll be kind to a stranger. What are your thoughts on that? Have you, real, have you noticed that? I have. And if you think about it, when we are around strangers, we even put on our best face, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're kind or, or we're professional and we've got that facade. But when, when we, as working professionals, have that facade on all day and then you get home after a hard day, what do you do? You're like, oh my God. And then the dog's barking. It's like, would you stop? Or the kids come in and you're like, you guys, I can't handle this anymore. We drop that facade a little bit um, because we care for those people. They might get the negative from us, but it's because we're comfortable with them and we love them. So I think there's some of that to it. 
Um, think about kids. I, I know when my kids were little, um, the teachers would talk about how wonderful they were, and then they'd walk in the door. It's like, what are these words coming out of your mouth? You're being yeah, such or, a little brat. Or going to the doctor. You take them to the doctor, and they're like, good, fine, yeah. fine. You're yeah, like, who yeah. are you? So I think there's some of that. Um, I think also as I, I even, as, as a professional in this, I even find times when I'm supporting some family members who are living with dementia, where in my mind, I'm expecting her to behave like she did 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I know she has dementia, but there's still that human in me. There's still that family member in me that thinks, why are you doing this? And you're being so rude. No, she's not Leslie. So sometimes mm -hmm. I need a Teresa to talk me off the ledge too. And I need Leslie. It's hardest with your own family. It is. It really is. Even though you know these, these tools and tricks, and trust me, they help me tremendously, but I'm still human a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I even need to step away and I need to talk with my other family members and say, hey, I just want to tell you what happened. And they they give me back my own words, which I need to hear sometimes. I really do. And we're family. You know, think about it. Regardless of a diagnosis or professional education on my part in this area, we are still family. And families are full of richness and depth and characters and personalities. And we're still not, we're still going to have that going on. Um, so we're not going to make it perfect. But by utilizing a lot of the things we've talked about today, we can sure help make it a lot better for the individual who's working really hard all day. And I know you all listening are working very hard all day. So having grace for them and having grace for yourself is really important. And knowing when to maybe just step away, go sit on the front porch and have a cup of coffee for a little bit and then come back and try it again. Yeah. It, knowing it's hardest on the you know, the people closest to them. Uh -huh. Um, I've noticed families, you got to really pull together and use your strengths and, yeah. um, communicate. I know with our family, we developed, um, a, a family text with my siblings, uh -huh. uh, because we needed to communicate and stick together on this because it was a big job, but everybody had skills and talents, you know, if they're willing to, to help. And it was a good thing. I know Tipa has said one in five families stay together, after going through this. Mm -hmm. And that's just an amazing statistic. Ooh. Well, wow. your business is different and I need you to focus on your company. Tell us more um, about um, your, your business and how people can contact you. Sure. Um, yeah. Cause you're, what you do is different uh, And you know, I don't know anyone else who does what you do yet. It's a huge, wonderful tool for communities. I know. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the company name is Inspired Senior Care. You can go to my website. Um, you'll see it's very colorful. Um, I am all about uh, joy in life. And I think colors bring joy in life. Mm -hmm. um, but on that page, you can kind of see what my company is all about. Um, there are on that site, I have a blog where you can see different um, articles. You remember I talked about there were 12 different topics. Mm -hmm. I have 12 different articles on there that talk about each one of those. So each month I put out um, dialogue and discussion about what those topics are. Everything from communication to language to the words that we use. Um, I think it is very important. I'm going to throw this in there right now that, um, you know, language, your parent or whoever you're supporting right now, they're not a patient, right? They don't need to be treated like a patient. They're a person. Mm -hmm. um, if they live in a senior living, they're a resident. They're not a patient. They don't get toileted. They, you know, try to use language that helps support them just like you live today. Uh, anyway, sorry, I got off on, on the topic there a little bit, but um, I have posters on there that you can take a look at. I have conversation cards. So the conversation cards, there are 220 of them, and all of you have access to that right now. Um, go to my app. It's on Apple or Android. It's called Inspired Senior Care. And if you go into it, when you log in, um, it doesn't cost you anything. Go in and log in as a care partner mm -hmm. and you'll see the 12 different topics. And these conversation cards help provide nuggets of information to help you in this journey. And then it gives a share section. We want you to share your thoughts on that mm. topic. So it gets you experientially to feel it yourself as a human being 
And then, okay, how can I use this to help my loved one? Um, there are 220 of them. There's lots to learn, so much out there. Uh, I would encourage you to take a look at that. I think you can look at half of the content before it ever asks you, I think $1.99 a month, something like that. Uh, so those are just ways that you can look at my content. I'm also on Instagram. Uh, I try to throw out content. I've got a lot of personal stuff going on right now. So I share some of that with you as well. Um, anyway, that's, that's, that's my stuff. Um, it's, it's a passion for me. And if you want to reach out to me, my email address, uh, you can reach out to me on the uh, website itself. There's a contact information at the bottom as well. So great. And I just want to give a shout out to these resident communities. There are great tools. Nobody else has these tools. And um, to be able to huddle up your staff and give them some tools. I know it's hard to prepare people caring for our seniors because everything's moving fast and we're short on staff. And so it's hard to get them trained well. Uh -huh. But what if, what if you put, you had these learning cards and what if you had posters and what if when we huddle up, we keep talking about this one great tool. I mean, I think what you're doing, Leslie, is fabulous. And I so appreciate you being here with me today and giving me some of your time. I know you're busy. But to share these ideas, listen, people out there, go to her website, check it out. Um, there's some really great tools for you there. And I so appreciate her sharing. I wish I had more time to go even further with this because she is a wealth of information. Well, thanks so much for being here today. Be sure and like and subscribe and please share this with someone who needs to know more. Another idea on how we can care for people living with brain change. It's all around us. And these are a lot of folks that we just don't have the tools naturally to take care of. Thanks again for being here and keep in mind you all, you got this.